Pay attention. Video. After that. Keep going. Push, push, push. Good job, McKenna. Eva, say hi. It's been a year of holidays, birthdays, and anniversaries these 21 families have gone through without the ones they love. Children, mothers who didn't make it home from school. Now, one year later of trying to process this unbelievable pain, we set out to see what has changed in New Valley. The city once overflowing with the seemingly unbreakable bond of Uvalde strong is fracturing at the seams. The families of the victims are fighting for changes to gun laws so that this doesn't happen to anyone else. The question now, how does Uvalde and the South Texas community move forward? We've spent one year in Uvalde. And over the next hour, we're going to look back at the past 365 days. The survivors, victims, families, along with the other people of Uvalde, will tell you in their own words how they've dealt with this horror. Our lives have been turned upside down. We will never be the same. Our families will never be the same. Turn it. Let me see. <laughs> It's very surreal sometimes. It's like that split second where you wake up in the morning and you forget everything. And I don't know. It's just unfortunate. I literally cannot describe any other way than this is not anything I would wish on anyone. It definitely doesn't feel like a year. I always hear that time heals all wounds, but time goes by and the wound is still there and the pain is there the emptiness is there I think as a mother I always feel an unexplainable well it's explainable just emptiness like something's always missing there's always one less plate that I make at dinner there's always one less child that I wake up for school one less kid I do homework with, you know, just one less laughter. I mean, even the little things that were, that were irritating just from being a parent and having kids, like the noise. I used to say, yeah, calm down, there's so many of you. And now when it's quiet, it's just, I would give anything to have that noise back. I mean, anything. I'm always constantly doing something, trying to help, trying to work. But there are times when you're just, you're sitting there trying to even watch a movie and then it just, you break, you, I mean, completely break down I mean, until you're a, a blubbering mess on the floor. You don't want to get up. You don't want to do anything. You don't want to live. You're not suicidal, but you don't want to be here. 
because it hurts that much. I don't think I've had a single moment where I didn't think about the shooting or talk about the shooting. It just, it's a part of me now that's never gonna go away. We're also talking about the headstone. I have no idea what we want to do with it, but I know we're gonna get it eventually. But it's one of those things that are hard to talk about. It's like, it's one of those things that solidifies everything. And with the year coming up, like, it's getting harder. Like, this, this nights have started up again. The what ifs, the it still feels unreal. Like, what would it be like to have her here? You know, what I'd give to hear her tell me I love you one more time or to even hear her voice, you know? Sometimes it just hits you so hard, like, that, you know, you're never gonna see her again. And then, like you said, before you know it, a year goes by. She was always my little girl in my eyes. It was to see her, to see her see me as the same, you know, it, it really did mean a lot to me because she, she loves her family. The way he laughs sounds exactly like her. The faces that he makes, like, it, it's really quick, but we're able to see the faces and we just, it's, it reminds us, like, so much of her. When we go somewhere or if we go to the store or something and he says he wants something for his dither, because he calls her dither, mm -hmm. um, I, I let him. <laughs> because he loves her and he doesn't know any different. He still thinks that she's going to come. So whatever he wants to get for her, we get it. When I don't want anybody to see me cry, I get in the shower and that's my crying time. And what keeps me sane is listening to praise music, praying and talking to God, because other than that, I feel like I'd be going insane because of how hard it is. Like, that was my baby, you know? And it's... It's very hard without her. It's like, it's hard to live without her. It's like, sometimes it's even hard just to breathe. You know, just the thought of her, like, she's never coming back. I think in order to move forward, you'd have to accept what happened, and we have not and will not accept what has happened to our children. Does it feel like it's almost been a year at this point? I think it feels both both ways. Yeah. It feels like, how how is it already a year? That it's like an eternity since I've seen her. We'll always be stuck on May 24th, no matter what year it is. We'll always be stuck on May 24th. <clears throat> like, like everybody's lives, 21 families' lives, like literally stopped that day. Yeah, we go on, but we're still stuck on that day. I stare at Amory's picture. Who would have thought that that was gonna be like part of history, mm -hmm. you know, or that these girls that went to school together were going to to die together, you know, like, and then bring all of us, you know, together. That's what she's always wanted, was her own room, because we shared a room. So I, that was the first thing that came to my head when we got a house. I was like, make sure there's an extra room for Eliana. And I try to like, the bed, I try to get, you know, she always wanted a bed with one of the enveloped things. So I was like, when we went into the place in San Antonio where we went to go find a bed, I was like, this is the one, like it has to be the one. And so we got it, it was um, Cinderella's carriage. So yeah, and that's what we got for her. The water bottle. I placed this water bottle here because every morning she would always take waters to um, school in her backpack and I found it in her backpack and this is from 11 months ago and I felt like to place it on the desk so like I could feel like okay she's gonna come and she's gonna sit here and do her work. So that is the water that she had in her backpack.
and everything that she had in there the day of is still in there. I didn't want to take anything out or move anything around. Everybody knows who did Columbine. Everybody knows who did Parkland. But what you don't remember are the names of the victims. And I have personally went to every parent of every school shooting that I've ever met and I have apologized profusely to them for not doing anything beforehand. And I feel like my inactions helped make it where that was acceptable. And so, that it, it, these are conversations that nobody, nobody should have. But I'm not gonna let my son be a number. He's not gonna be a statistic. You're gonna remember his name. You're gonna remember Uzziah Garcia. You're gonna remember his face. And if you forget, then you're gonna see my face and you're gonna hear my name and you're gonna remember him. We remember all of their names. Coming up, those that survived the shooting, how that day changed their lives forever. We're also gonna to talk to a school bus driver who turned emergency responder the day of the shooting. Her story on television for the very first time, coming up. Providing health care to people who need it most. That's the simple but powerful purpose behind Doctors Without Borders. We treat wounded people in war zones, care for malnourished children, and provide safe reproductive health care. We're on the ground in emergencies from Ukraine to Afghanistan. We put patients first and we go where we're needed most. Because at Doctors Without Borders, we believe people deserve to be treated with compassion and dignity. We treat our patients completely free of charge and without regard to race, religion, or politics. Doctors Without Borders has provided free, life-saving medical care for over 50 years. And thanks to the six million people around the world who support our work, Doctors Without Borders will continue to put our patients first. It's been said that when someone you love has Parkinson's, you have Parkinson's. If you have questions, the Parkinson's Foundation has answers. To learn more, please go to parkinson.org or call 1-800-4PD-INFO. For the survivors of Rob Elementary, life hasn't been easy this past year. They're haunted by what they saw, what they heard that day. Their families are battling a mix of emotions, navigating a life with PTSD. So how long have you guys been friends for? A year. A year? How'd y'all meet? In school. In school. And what do you guys like to do together? Play, Play football. football. We usually talk to each other, stay up till midnight. When they're around each other, they like the company. I mean, it's not just them, it's the group that they're, that you know, started pulling together. I mean, there are kids that are missing out of our group, but you know, it's them that got more of the bond. Whenever you guys are both feeling sad, do you ever talk to each other just to try and help out? Well, we don't really talk about that in the group. You don't? Yeah, we try to stay in the future, not the past. They're reliving their life again, and that's what we wanted. At the beginning, we were strangers, and now I feel like we've become a big family. AJ suffered a gunshot wound to his upper right thigh. He's like, Mom, I just ran. I saw the backpacks and I hid under him like if I was dead. He couldn't move. And he tried not to move until help came. But then he didn't know if help was really there because of the person, the personation that the shooter was doing of trying to be a cop inside the classroom. He says that. He wished he was able to help his friends, but there was really not much anything that he could do because he didn't want to move from under the table because he was afraid that if he did move or, you know, even just peek out from the curtain and move the curtain, you know, over to a little bit that 
you know, the shooter was going to see him and shoot him. I think it was around 11, 11, 15 maybe, those troopers, and we said, oh, there's another bailout, because it's very common here in town. You've probably heard it a million times. One of the dispatchers comes and says, do you mind going to Rob and picking up kids? And I said, what's going on? And she's like, well, there, there was a situation, but it's under control. Okay, this is mass chaos, you know, all these people, parents, you know, what's, go what's really going on? I saw someone I knew and I said, what are you doing here? What's going on? And she goes, there's an active shooter. I was thinking, there's no way somebody's shooting kids. There's no way. I'm sitting in my bus and I just see these, these military people or the board tag, because they were in camel. They have kid one, they have kids, they're carrying kids. And so they just dart to my bus and I open the door. They look like they were very, very badly injured. No, we need these kids to help. We need medical attention. And parents are trying to get inside your bus. Mm -hmm. They were banging. And I was like, oh my God, I told him, I have to go lock the door. What happens on a school bus when you lock the door? It beeps completely the whole time because it's telling you that that door is locked. It's not supposed to be locked. We should get these kids to the hospital. That's what we're trying to do. So we followed a police officer, EMS, and then I followed them going, I mean, fast as we could. Did you have even a moment to process the fact you had kids who had been shot on the bus? I, you know, I think back and it's like, I don't think I cried till I, till they got off at the hospital, that I just sat there and I was like, what just happened, you know? Because I could hear them crying and, and yelling and, you know, they wanted their mom. Well, all those kids are family. One of them was my students. On my route. I went to her funeral. I became a bus driver because I know my business wasn't taking off and I needed benefits and... But God put me there. These are like little um, birds. We have a 24-year-old Reuben Jr. and we have a 12-year-old Zachary, okay. Zachary Isaiah, and um, Maya, 11 now. Obsessed with that button. Like, I think we're doing okay. I think um, it's been a ride, um, but we're doing okay. I think, yeah. Um, seeing Maya progress the way she has is really, really helped us a lot. It's, it's been interesting. Yeah. I don't even know what to say. It's twilight zone, let's put it that way. It's been like the twilight zone. <laughs>
but she has occupational therapy. She has physical therapy, which are two different uh, sessions. And then, yeah, she goes to her counseling sessions on a weekly basis. And I think um, both occupational and, and uh, physical are, are weekly. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's a full day. It's, it's a full day, day, a full week. Yeah, which is our reason for staying close by. <laughs> yeah. She doesn't talk as much like she used to. So that's a big one for me. So yeah, I mean, she was carefree. I think uh, Maya shows like um, a fear in this of this world that she didn't have before. You know, she's more aware of things that she didn't, she wasn't aware of before. Maya's strong. Yeah. That's how we are helping her. Maybe it's the other way around, how is she helping us? Because that's probably the reality. How does she help you? Move forward. Not, she'll tell you, nothing happened to you, keep going. <laughs> and she's always making jokes to just to get you for not being scared or whatever it is. But she's stronger than, than me, I guess. And I think I'm tough, but she's strong. It's almost like you don't even think twice. You just keep going because you've got to. You, I mean, what else is there to do? You can't just, you know, stop. We're looking forward to going back to your body. Despite of everything, it's our home. That's where we grew up and that's where our families and friends are there, you know. So, yeah, we'll be returning to your body. McKenna was a really good friend of Maya's. One thing I, I'll never forget about McKenna was uh, Maya had softball. And um, I think McKenna's sisters were in practice, you know. And so instead of McKenna watching sisters practice, she would come and sit in the stands with us. And she had her drink and she had her little bag of chips or a snack. And she'd be there until Maya finished and she'd go and say good job to Maya. It's been pretty hard on Maya losing um, her friends. It feels like it just happened last month. Like it doesn't feel like it's been um, that long that's gone by. It really doesn't. And that's, that's like mind blowing to think about that it is gonna be a year already. How do you both feel approaching that one year mark since what happened last year. How does that make you feel, AJ? Well, it makes me feel not happy. Can you tell me about that? It makes me feel like sad since it happened, you know? Mm, a little bit sad. Can you tell me about that, Jane? Because I really do miss my friends and my teachers and my two cousins. Today, I feel like maybe it just happened like last month. I guess because it's still, to, like in my mind, I feel like it's still fresh. To me as a mom, you live to protect your kids, you know, and me, I didn't think I did my job that day. It just seems like a dream, like you just, like you watched a, you know, a horror movie and, and there it is again, replaying in your head what you just saw or what you went through. That day, it was sad, dramatic. You know, it's a lot of emotions. It's already gonna be a year. I cry the same. No doubt the community here continues to struggle with the reality of losing 21 loved ones, yet the people here are just as committed to making sure that the 19 students and two teachers continue to live on in other ways. That's after the break. What is your healing power? Maybe your healing power is helping veterans with PTSD, traumatic brain injuries, depression, anxiety, or loneliness. Is your healing power a simple heartfelt letter or being a volunteer? It is estimated that over a half a million current warfighters will return from service diagnosed with PTSD, and 22 veterans will commit suicide every day. Our veterans have paid the ultimate sacrifice for our country. At HealVets.org, you can find out more about the healing power of pen pals, volunteers, therapy kits, and more. Discover your healing power at HealVets.org. 
Help Heal Veterans, together with you, has been helping one recovering veteran at a time. We are helping veterans heal together with you. What is your healing power? To find out about your power, visit HealVets.org. Before I was adopted, I kind of felt alone. I felt nervous that I wouldn't have a family. And I didn't think I was going to get adopted because I knew I was getting older and older and older. I didn't think that was going to happen. With help from the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, Lexi, Connor, and Lashana now have the love and support of a forever family. When I did get adopted, it was like, wow, I get to settle and this is permanent. It was like a bunch of feelings. After I was adopted, I felt amazing and happy. Adoption changed me for the better. I feel as if I can be whoever I want to be. Every child deserves a safe, loving, and permanent home. Help the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption find homes for those waiting in foster care the longest. Learn more at DaveThomasFoundation.org. Though their lives were taken, their legacies continue. The 21 angels are being honored by their loved ones every day through scholarships, goals and dreams for the future, even in tattoos. An act of hate and evil in May 2022, not enough to snuff out the love felt here. For my parents, I think they feel closer to Jackie in her room. But for me, it's the cemetery because that's where she is. For sure, we always go for the holidays to decorate. Every time we go out of town, the next, whenever we come back, we visit. I can say, you know, I'm having a bad day. And one of the other moms will offer to drive me to get a coffee or to just talk or meet me at the cemetery and, um, you know, just sit there for a little while or anything. Yesterday was pretty hard, but we, we had everybody here. We were at the cemetery. Everybody came in and showed their support, so it meant a lot to us. I'm so, so grateful for all the support that we have here and everybody that showed up, even though it was raining. It just shows how important she was. It means not giving up no matter how how far, uh, fast or slow you do it. Her, her quote was always, it doesn't matter when you finish as long as you finish, and that's what, that's what was in my head this whole time. I just want us to share our story and make change and we're stronger together. And I love that it's female led mm -hmm. and I think Lexi would love that. We wanna make sure that we reach not just um, the families that have already been through this, but families that if you know, there's no changes that will be in our shoes one day. I have to force myself to get out of bed sometimes, but um, it's important because our girls meant the world to us and we're gonna continue until we get what they deserve, they get. You know, we need to find everything that's right for them. There's a lot of other groups, unfortunately, that are out there, and um, we just want to join forces with them to get our stories out as well. And we hope that someday we won't need this and we'll go a different direction. But for now, we are our children's, our family's voices, you know, our loved ones' voices. First is that we're parents because that's that's who we are at the end of the day. We're, we're moms and grandmas and I want them to know just how personal it is. And I think that's the approach we always take. It's, it's sharing these stories because everybody has somebody that they love and wouldn't want to lose. So that's that's the approach we take. Does it feel like what you're doing is going to save lives? Well, eventually, but at how many lives will be lost until we accomplish what our goal is. We just have to have hope, I guess. I don't, we just have to keep fighting. That's all we know how to do. It's the hearts, because not only are the colors representative of the children, but they're how I know that you're okay. If you can't send me a text, you just send me your color heart. I had always said I would never get a tattoo. 
Like, I love the way they look. I love the art of it. But I was like, I just, I'm scared of needles. But um, this happened and it's like, there's nothing that I can't do to myself that my daughter didn't have to go through. And so it was, it was I was like, okay. Let's do it. This one's my favorite. I loved it. Like, it wasn't on purpose, but like when I wear a t-shirt, sometimes all you can still see is just, it's by Lexi and I love mm -hmm. my mom, but mm -hmm. it's something she drew and it's me and her and I love that I get to see how she saw me. As a mom and as a daughter, I know how much my mom loves me, but my daughter wasn't given a chance to have children. So I kind of feel like, did she really, really grasp just the unconditional overwhelming love I have for you. I just hope I was enough. So the reminder is needed. I had read the letters that she would write to me and I found that I love you. So I decided like I want it on me. So I went to go get it. So that way when, you know, I'm feeling down or whatever, or if I want it here that I love you of our last conversation, I always just look down and I can read it. He was a Leo, so there's a mama lion and a baby lion. And then there's 21 sunflowers in the entire piece just to represent all of the lives. You know, someone will notice it. And I would say, you know, I got it for my son, he passed away. And then these are the other lives and from Uvalde. And you know, sometimes that's um, work in itself, just bringing even more awareness to just random people. The Spider-Man, uh, Uzi's favorite uh, comic character was Spider-Man. And um, he was always drawn to, he was drawn to superheroes and, and, you know, he wanted to be a cop. He loved helping people. Instead of, you know, Peter Parker's, you know, web slinging like that, every morning he would um, do that, I love you in sign language. So that's why it's turned upside down for, you know, I love you. Um, the number 21 is right there for all of the, lives. The next set two I got was the um, the American flag upside down with the sounds of children screaming have been removed and that resonated with me because you know the, the gunshots were still there. Everything that that ended their lives was there but the actual their life wasn't it was removed and it's not just their screams were removed their their voices, their laughter, their, their presence, it's all been removed from this, you know, mortal plane. That's what Uzi was left with, you know, a, a bullet hole into the spine. Imagine that that bullet went straight through his spine and tore out his stomach. Um, we need visualizations. Um, and like I said, without actively showing or dropping the actual photos, you can see it on me. And you can see what it looks like on a, on a 220 pound grown man. Now imagine that on a 10 year old that weighed 65, 70 pounds maybe. I mean, he was tiny. And if that looks like that on me, imagine what that looked like on him. Imagine what that looks like on your child. When she was a little, she couldn't say grandma. Or, and she, since she was little, Ganny and Ganny. So that's why when she did the, the tattoo, she's like, I love you so much, Ganny. So right here is, uh, I love you so much, Ganny. And then she put A Marie. And then she drew me. And then she put a G for Ganny. I immediately knew that I wanted to get a portrait of her. Um, this picture in particular I wanted to do because I mean she's sitting she's sitting on my lap and she's with me. I hate that I have to look up and see, you know. Pictures of her everywhere when she should just be right there. It's it's hard. It's I mean it looks cool, yeah. The tattoo looks amazing, but at the same time Sucks. We're planning on getting matching tattoos with my brother, so I've always wanted a dinosaur for my baby. He loves dinosaurs. So I was going to get one of the long neck dinosaurs, uh -huh. and then my brother was going to get a T-Rex, and then on Jackie's headstone, we're going to engrave a Triceratops. So we're all getting matching tattoos in one way or another.
it was just an internal battle of, I need to walk the stage because these kids are never gonna be able to. But then it was also, why do I get to walk the stage? These kids are never gonna be able to, it's not fair. I was always told that graduation, gradu graduating high school, walking the stage isn't really for you, it's for your family to see you. And so that's kind of what my family was telling me, but at the same time, it's not gonna be my last time graduating. I think she would want me to, but she was the type of person that was like, well, it's your choice in the end. I, wa I want this, I want this, and I want you to do that, but it's your choice. But really knowing that she wants me to. I wanted to do criminal psychology for a little while, but then after all this, I was like, I, I don't think I wanna get into all that. I think knowing what I know is more than enough. Faith The weekend before everything happened, we had been at a cousin's birthday party and it was a swimming party. And I told her, well, if you learn how to swim, you get to jump into the river with me. And she was like, okay, like watch me. She learned in that day, she learned how to swim. And I told her, I was like, okay, that means you're jumping in the river with me. And you know, it's sad that it doesn't get to happen, but. I think she'll be there. I know she'll be there. I told my parents they're taking this picture in with them and she's gonna have her own seat there. When May 24th happened, unfortunately, you know, we got, we all got assigned FBI crime victim specialists. Um, ours, her name happened to be Lenora. She was the sweetest lady ever. She took very good care of me and my parents. And she was explaining to me, you know, what she does for her job and everything. And I just thought like, this is perfect. Like, this is what I'm meant to do. I'm meant to help families who are going through the same pain me and my parents are going through. So, uh, FBI crime victim specialist, that's the end goal. And I just think if I could help somebody at least get through a little bit of that pain, it's helping me with my pain as well. I miss everything about her. She was my world. She wanted to be just like me, but I knew she was gonna be better. I knew she was gonna be, she was better than this world was. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. So how do you move forward after what happened here? And what exactly does moving forward look like? Rive Elementary is going to be demolished, but what does the community want in its place? There are eight schools in the Uvalde CISD, 4,000 students. Let's talk about security today and how secure the students are when they go into school. But we've made great strides in uh, our security fencing at every campus, eight foot high security fencing. Uh, we've ordered 600 uh, security cameras that are now in place. We are re-keying our district, moving toward secure access cards uh, and keypads. Uh, we are putting the final touches on a security operations center 
which will be a centrally located center where we can monitor all cameras and all access to all exterior doors in the, in, in the district. We're not quite finished. We, we have quite a bit of work to do to have uh, secure vestibules at each campus entrance. That has gone slow, uh, but that's in the plans. We'll continue to work. When I took this job on, the biggest, I guess my, my main goal was to build a foundation for the police department. And every officer since then that we've brought on is um, understanding that we're also building trust back with the community and building um, relationships back with the community and uh, along with our staff and our students. As far as training, we get them certified as uh, school-based law enforcement officers, which uh, entails them learning to deal with students with disabilities, uh, learning to deal with students um, that may have a 504 plan and things of that nature and also where that's not so common you in law enforcement but then you have the whole active shooter and alert piece to it so it's dealing with students with uh, certain types of disabilities and then it's also okay now this is the uh, alert active shooter piece so that's part of the training that is different when it comes to working in the school district. Are you confident that what you've been able to do since the start of the school year is enough? to prevent another shooting from happening. Uh, it's very difficult to secure every single student get on the bus anywhere in the community, right? It's very difficult to protect everything at large gatherings like football games and concerts. And other, I mean, um, there's just, you know, we were built, schools were built to include people in to all these facilities, not keep them away. And so there's still work to be done and our students can still be vulnerable in certain positions no matter, uh, no matter how much security we have. It's hard to be at 100%. So yeah, we still worry about it. I worry about that. Being in this role and being in this field as long as I have, I've had the same mindset and mentality that I'm going to keep your kids safe. Uh, because there's someone at my, my child's school that's going to keep my kids safe. And um, on the law enforcement side of it is uh, I will keep your kids safe. I will protect your child. And that, that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. I will protect your child. If, some, if a bad person inter entered our schools, I will protect your child at all costs. Does that mean you would have gone in the room? I will protect their child at all costs, ma'am. Thing like a park or anything to go up there because I just feel shouldn't be playing and celebrating where our children were murdered and that is what they were was murdered so it doesn't, that doesn't feel right so I thought maybe just um, plant some trees some nice flowers maybe a little walking trail through there you know just a peaceful like a passive park yeah as long as no other child has to go to that school, and it's what I want. So they can make like a memorial place for them, and like so they could be remembered and never forgotten. You know, like the way they've been doing, you know, it and stuff. So yeah, like a memorial place for them. I went to school there. My mom went to school there. There's so much history in that building that pretty much was flushed on the toilet the second that this guy walked into the building. I don't think I've thought about it too much. I know they mentioned something about a park, and while I think it's like sweet, at the same time, I think it's a little, like it's a little eerie to think about kids playing where kids died. There has to be something peaceful out of it. That's what I would like, whether it's a memorial. I know people visit the plaza downtown, but Really, it's here. There has to be something for them to be remembered there. Because it was, it, it started as a good day. It was a good day for them. You know, the awards, you know, 
and their activities that they were doing. But I know it's tragic as well. How do you balance that? We're looking at breaking ground this summer and then um, 18 months is about the uh, number of months it takes to build a school of this uh, size. And so we're looking at you know, late fall of 24 to be substantially completed. There'll be safety and security that are unseen, that are gonna be keeping the children safe and the student and the adults safe. And then so that they can focus on uh, learning and, and, and teaching and, and enjoying uh, the, the time that they have at the school. There's a glassed-in walkway. Uh, it's two stories, uh, and within that walkway will be a representation of an oak tree. It will branch off in two main branches, representing the two teachers. And then from those two branches, there'll be 19 smaller branches that represent the students. Uh, and that structure will be a part of the building. It'll reach up to the ceiling. It'll be there for the next 90 years as a, a, a memory of, of, of the children and the adults that uh, passed away. This is the reason why this school is um, being provided uh, to the community of Uvalde and we want to make sure that we bring their thoughts uh, into this uh, work as well as have um, uh, an appropriate uh, component of the school to, to remember the 19 children and the two teachers. What happened last year in May is not going to define Uvalde. How Uvalde has come together to move forward from that is what's defining Uvalde. When this tragedy became part of the national conversation, members of the public went to their lawmakers to see what they were doing to keep school children safe. How that quickly became political. It's been said that when someone you love has Parkinson's, you have Parkinson's. If you have questions, the Parkinson's Foundation has answers. To learn more, please go to parkinson.org or call 1-800-4PD-INFO. This is entitled El Corrido, Corrido de los Ángeles de Ovalde. Los árboles de Ovalde Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to sing this corrido about the tragedy that happened in Uvalde, Texas. On May 24th in the year 2022. It's part of the, the Mexican, the Hispanic culture because uh, when a tragedy does happen, the first thing we do is that we unite. That's the first thing that we do. Then the next thing that we do is we start sharing stories. The music does heal. Un monstruo perturbado llegó a la oscuridad. Songs are stories, ballads that we've told, you know, and this is how generations have maintained historical documentation through song. Corridos are due to do that. Corridos are so specific. They can record uh, you know, massacres, train accidents. We always come together. Together we heal and overcome. So let us say our prayers, our prayers for the familias, for the brave teachers, and for the angels of Uvalde. The families whose lives were torn apart here one year ago are writing their own story, turning those thoughts and prayers into action, going to our state's capital and demanding changes to gun laws. Really look at the people that you're voting in to office because it could potentially save your child's life. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would encourage people to go out and vote and vote for politicians who are in favor of gun control. You might not agree with everything that that politician stands for, 
but gun violence is the number one killer of children so it should be your priority above all else kids are the kids safety should be our priority i don't ever wish this upon anybody and that's why like we fight so much for the laws to change or whatever because like it's hard to be on this side it is very hard and we don't want nobody else to be on this side it's like it's the hardest thing like yes you you can lose your your mother your grandmother your uncle your aunt but when it's actually your own child that is by far the hardest thing to bear it's like sometimes it's so unbearable the pain And I'll be the first one to tell you that it's very possible that if Representative Goodwin or Representative Bowers or Representative Vice Chair Johnson or Chairman Moody had filed a raise the age bill uh, during the last session of the legislature or the session before, I probably would have voted against it. And I've said that publicly. But uh, at 1130, Muscle Mantles on May 24th of 2022, everything changed. Uh, it changed for me because at about 11.30 in the morning on that day, and I was in Uvalde that day, uh, uh, a shooter walked into Rob Elementary School, and within about three minutes, uh, he shot 38 people. 19 students and two teachers died. And that changed uh, my life. I arrived here today at 8 a.m. And as we waited more than 13 hours, I'm reminded of May 24th, 2022, when we waited hours to be told our daughter would never come home. I expressed confusion then, and I'm perplexed now. Did you think we would go home? Our hearts may be broken, but our resolve has never been stronger. 21 for 21, let's raise the age. Tess didn't have a choice in life or death, but you as leaders have a choice of what my daughter's life will be remembered for. Will she die in vain, or will her life have saved another child? Maybe your child. 18 to 21 isn't much to ask. As a grieving mother, I'm begging you to please hear me out and don't let my daughter's murder mean nothing to you. I'm a gun owner. I believe in the Second Amendment right. I'm a concealed carrier. So, again, we're not here for that. All we are asking is for reasonable common gun sense laws. I did not prepare a speech for you guys today. It's just, I'm just a mom. I'm not even sure which one of you exactly or sometimes are Democratic or Republican because I don't care. I just don't want any of you to sit here where I'm sitting. I don't want you to have to identify your child's body based on what he was wearing to school that day. Thoughts and prayers. I'm so sick of hearing those three words from our elected officials. While your prayers may have conf comforted you, they did nothing to absolve our pain. While you may think about May 24th, we live it every single day. While you pray that your children grow up to be healthy and happy, contributing members of society, we pray that our children knew we were doing everything we could to get to them in that school to protect them. Your thoughts and prayers didn't stop an 18-year-old from purchasing two high-powered semi-automatic rifles and all of those rounds of ammunition. Your thoughts and prayers didn't stop us from having to bury our children and two teachers. Your thoughts and prayers do not help the children that survived that were injured. Your thoughts and prayers are empty. Legislation is not. Thank you. Listening to them, 
tell their stories and say they weren't just going to go home. They were going to have their say. That was inspiring. So I think two things can be true at once. One is that what those families are experiencing at the Capitol is a farce. Nothing that they're really pushing for is going to happen. But the other thing that's true is their voices do matter. Any chance of any of these bills making it to the floor of the House or the Senate? Absolutely not. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick has uh, not said this specifically, but he is in no mood to bring any gun control measures to the floor. I don't think Republicans are in the mood to even have record votes uh, on, you know, on the floor about these gun control measures. I would not expect it to be set for a debate before the session is over. There, there'll be eight ayes, five nays, and zero present not voting in motion. Yes! It didn't change history, but for that moment, they had peace. They had, you know, just a small answer to the question and potentially uh, a big answer to a solution. And I and I was excited for them. And certainly, you know, tears welled up in my eyes and, and as I hugged all of them. I don't want to defeat, you know, the the excitement of the parents that that saw the bill and 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 you know were. All these motions were, were brewing in them. I don't want to defeat that. But at the end of the day, I think it was an exercise in fertility. I think it was just an ex exercise just to simply, again, take the attention away from what happened in Allen, take the attention away from the assault weapon itself. The lack of legislative progress is not a deterrent to these families. If anything, they are as committed to honoring and fighting for the 21 lives lost as they have ever been. As we leave you tonight, we want to leave you with those 21 names and faces. A year ago, we made a promise to remember their names. That promise does not end tonight. For all of us at KSAT 12, thanks for joining us.